Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome to um, our Charlottesville City School Board meeting, today being October 6th. And if you will, um, please join us in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. And if you will please stand and, and uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And if we can now, um, Madam Clerk, if you will call for roll call of board members, please. Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Here. Ms. Dooley. Present. Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. McKeever. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, Mr. Morris. Present. Ms. Torres. Yes, thank you. And then our student rep, Mrs. Bird. Here. <laughs> thank you very much. And I do wanna extend a warm welcome to our student rep, Ms. Bird. Thank you for being here tonight. All right, may I now have a motion uh, for approval of our agenda, please? Second. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Now we're moving on to our first opportunity for comments from members of the community. We do have some people here in the media center and I think we'll start with those people here. Um, and first on the list, we have Mr. Alex Zan. Please keep in mind, um, keep your comments to three minutes. Thanks. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Charles Alexander, also known as Mr. Alexander, one of the Charlottesville 12 students. And the last time I was in this building and this space was in 2018, when Charlottesville 12 presented to the school board the Charlottesville 12 Scholarship Fund. And we have some of the members here on this picture. Uh, I'm here today in support of the remaining name of Benable Elementary School, or if you choose to rename Benable Elementary School, my suggestion, along with others, is the Benable Nine. That would be what. First of all, my preference would be to remain, for Venable to remain Venable. But if those choose to rename, secondly, in support of the Venable Nine, on behalf of the Charlottesville 12 students, parents, families, and community members. And I want to share a couple of comments from Charlottesville 12 students. First, Sandra Wicks Lewis. I fully support in favor of maintaining Venable and the committee's renamed suggestion, Venable Nine. This also is in honor of my courageous parents, Robert and Elizabeth Wicks, and the other Charlottesville 12 parents and families. And by the way, uh, I'm son of a Charlottesville. 12 parent, the last surviving parent. Her name is Elizabeth Alexander Taylor. She's the real Liz Taylor. Next is concerning the Venable name change. We support the name change to Venable Nine. This will continue the legacy of the 1959 desegregation of Charlottesville schools. 
Otherwise, no one would remember the 1959 historic event. The students and our parents made a great sacrifice to further the cause of integration in Charlottesville. Future generations would also benefit from this significant time period. Ronald and Roland Woodfall, also Charlottesville 12 students. Next is from Bezina Howard, her mother, and two brothers, Wim and Marvin Townsend, with Charlottesville 12 students. My mother, Thelma Townsend, and brothers Marvin and Wim was the vital part of the Charlottesville 12. And in their absence, I support the name Venerable Nine, Bazina Howard. Next, we have as the former principal of Venerable from 1991 to 2003, I'm very familiar with Charles Venable and his history, et cetera. I totally support and endorse the committee's suggestion to change the name of the school to Venable Nine. I believe it is a most appropriate, appropriate name for the school, Ron Broadbent. Next, we have a gentleman from the Venable Neighborhood Association. I share your concern about the importance of re retaining a name for Venable that preserves the history of the school for students, both past and present. I strongly support the concept of the Venable Nine and their families having a significant and influential voice in the school name. I've completed the survey and have registered for the October 19th form as well. Some fellow board members who have responded thus far love the Venable Nine naming idea. We're sending out an email to 200 or so addresses to encourage them to complete the survey. Jay Scott, Venable Neighborhood Association. Also have some positive comments from former NAACP icon, Mr. Eugene Williams. He's in favor of if there were to be a name change to be the Venable Nine, as well as Ann Wicks Carter, a past Charlottesville school educator and black historian in Charlottesville. And in closing, I just wanna share a few of my personal comments. Uh, keeping the name of Venable will continue the legacy of former students prior to 1959 and after 1959. It will also continue to share the Charlottesville 12 story, hopefully years to come. Venable name will continue to be a beacon for the neighborhood and its surroundings, speaking of the Venable neighborhood. And I want to close and share this from one of my elders, which I highly regard, and we're all here on the shoulders of our elders. She's told me a while back, Mr. Alexander, if they let everything go, everything goes. I don't have to tell you folk in terms of how much we have let go and what we're dealing with today. Uh, and I also like to acknowledge Mr. James Bryant in terms of keeping alive the Lane High School reunion. Uh, recently, the 1972 class celebrated. Cause, and I'm a 1970 graduate of Lane High School. And pretty soon, or not, if not at this moment, if somewhere, someone were to mention Lane High School, people would have said, who, where, what is it? Because as you know, Almar County purchased that building and it's no longer Lane High School. So it's very important to keep that name. Uh, lastly, Venable is also an extension of Black History Pathway, which is 4th Street, Honorary Street. We have put Venable School as part of that whole uh, pathway, uh, which we are putting together. So at this time, I would like to thank you for your time and consideration. Hopefully, uh, you will come to the decision to maintain Venable in its present name, just Venable. But if 
the decision were to be made to rename it, preferably, we suggest for many members of the community, the Venerable Nine. Thank you, and I don't know whether there's any questions or not, or any comments. Not right now. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, I just mentioned, just a side note, I mentioned to Dr. Gurley, as well as Beth Chubb. You may have seen around Charlottesville some yard signs that says, yo, let it go. I've got a stack of posters, which I am contributing to Charlottesville schools at no cost. And many times schools wait until something happened and then you call all the grief counselors after the fact. So it would be good if you take the advantage and utilize these free posters and maybe we can interrupt this culture of violence in the Charlottesville community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next we have Ms. Jessica Taylor, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jessica Taylor, as you know. I'm a reading specialist at Clark and current president of the Charlottesville Education Association. And I wanted to take a couple of minutes to publicly thank Dr. Gurley and the board for the progress that we have made toward a collaboratively developed resolution for collective bargaining. It was exciting to see city council pass theirs earlier this week, especially knowing that they had worked with the two unions that had come to them with signed cards to make sure that the ordinance they passed worked for everyone. While you are in no way obligated to follow the lead of city council regarding scope of bargaining or any other aspect of the ordinance they passed, I strongly encourage you to review their ordinance language and take steps to establish a timeline to create a similar allowance for a broad scope of bargaining. It has been clear over the last few years that the voice and expertise of employees is valued within this division's decision making, and we want to see that commitment codified. We are optimistic that we are very close to finding agreement on the details of the resolution, and we will be back in touch as soon as we can provide more constructive feedback on the proposal we reviewed with Dr. Gurley and the team earlier this week. In the meantime, I also want to share with you that educators and students both have reported that while the current proposals by our governor to modify the transgender policy are causing some stress and discomfort, everyone has felt that the actions taken by Dr. Gurley, the principals and the board have mitigated those concerns as much as possible. Educators appreciate the support they have received in supporting students and are encouraged by the commitment and equity to equity and the protection of vulnerable students. Members of the Charlottesville Education Association stand ready and willing to work collaboratively with you on this issue as well. The last couple of weeks have been extremely challenging for a number of reasons. And we look forward to continuing to talk about ways we can support employees as they process these events. Thank you. Thank oh, you. I also have for you um, just some information about um, from the VEA about um, how to support transgender youth. And so I'll just leave that with Leslie for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Miss Christine Esposito, recent birthday girl. Good evening, Dr. Gurley, Madam Chair, and school board members. I'm Christine Esposito, the 3 4 resource teacher, gifted resource teacher at Johnson, and I live in the city. I'm here to share some of my experiences here as a gifted teacher in the city and specifically at Johnson. Since the city made the decision to shift our model to be inclusive rather than exclusive, I've had the privilege to watch magic happen on an almost daily basis. Whether it is watching a student who struggles to decode delve deeply into analyzing Jabberwocky, or the lyrics to the song Glory from the movie Selma, or watching a student who struggles in math feel successful as they work through a series of non-linguistic logic puzzles, or to try and find an equation for all the numbers between one and 20, but only allowed to use four fours. 
Every student has the opportunity to be challenged. Every student has the opportunity to feel like school is and should be hard. As students walk in the door in the morning, they ask me if I'm going to make their brains hurt today. When the answer is invariably yes, I am often greeted with greatly exaggerated groans accompanied by big smiles. This has been possible not because I'm the challenge fairy sprinkling challenges here and there for students who need them, but because at Johnson, we made the fundamental shift in how we work. While we have always viewed students as our students, the structure of the gifted program and intervention meant that reading and math specialists worked with their kids and I worked with my kids. And sometimes in very rare moments, those groups might have overlapped. Today, they are truly our kids. I work closely with our math specialist and our reading specialist to support and complement tier one instruction during my push-in lessons. More importantly, and in my opinion, far more powerfully, I am working with classroom teachers, reading and math specialists to differentiate instruction throughout the day. It has always been true that students are not gifted for an hour a week. It has always been true that students deserve to be challenged no matter where they are on their learning journey. This new gifted model has allowed all of us to look at our students with new eyes. I have learned how to better scaffold the challenges I offer and I hope that I have helped teachers and specialists find places in the day where even the students who struggle the most are given opportunities to shine. We are still very much a work in progress, but in the fall of 2018, if you had told me we would be here, I would not have believed you. My new, more amazing job is a daily reminder that some of the solutions to the challenges we face are hampered only by the failures of our imaginations. Thank you. All right, Mr. Como, do we have? Yeah, I do have um, someone. Jonathan is uh, promoted to be able to speak. He's virtual tonight. All right, Mr. Tillak. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I uh, have a student in the school system, and I just wanted to very briefly express my concern over the proposed uh, Virginia Department of Education uh, published draft provisions to the model transgender policies. Um, specifically, I feel that these proposals put in real danger uh, students who are uh, already uh, having uh, severe issues with mental health, uh, bullying, and other things. So I was hoping that um, uh, I'd like to request a couple things. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, have everyone, if they can, um, suggest the revocation of these draft provisions and, and to return to the existing uh, model. And then I would also like to uh, hope that the school board can uh, reject these new policies and, and protect these vulnerable students. And uh, I think the best way to do that is to maintain the policies that we've been operating under. Uh, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Como, anybody else? Okay, I think that she's not in there yet. All right, but I think that's a good time um, and a good segue into something that I'd like to read tonight. Um, and this may have gone out to the community already, but in response to Youngkin's administration's proposed changes regarding the treatment of students who identify as transgender and non-binary, the Charlottesville City School Board strongly affirms Superintendent Dr. Gurley's commitment to continue to support our LGBTQ plus students, staff, parents, and guardians, and others within our school communities. In this stance, we are supported by federal Title IX legislation, which extends school protections based on gender identity. In addition, our approach is in keeping with Virginia law, which requires the Virginia Department of Education to issue guidance to support transgender students according to evidence-based best practices. It is worth noting that a recent attempt to legislatively overturn this law in Virginia failed. Our approach also follows our own non-discrimination policy, which since 2013 has protected students based on gender expression and identity. 
On top of all of this, protecting students is the right thing to do. We are committed to maintaining our existing policy adopted earlier this fall, which brings together in one place our prior practices for creating a supportive environment for gender expansive and other students. While we continue to learn in, and grow in our capacity to support transgender and non-binary students, we are committed to moving forward with best practices supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and others. We will not retreat to fear, misunderstanding, and bullying. One example of how the governor's proposed new guidance fails to extend basic respect to transgender and non-binary students is the simple courtesy of calling students by their chosen name. Schools across the country already extend this practice to their students, whether the child uses a middle name, a variation of their first name, or a completely different name or nickname. Why? per this pending guidance, would we exempt our gender expansive students from this basic decency? We have always partnered with families and will continue to do so. Part of the school's role in every area of a child's growth is to work alongside students and families and to help them navigate new terrain and to seek their help as we also navigate new terrain. Having said that, one of the values that schools offer young people is another set of trusted adults. Most of us can recall a time when we asked a caring teacher, clergy member, relative, or family friend for support, counsel, or a lifeline. Rejecting such connections for young people limits the very resource, resources that have always been available to them. Mentoring relationships are at the heart of a successful school, and we want to nurture those relationships, not police them. We are proud and privileged to stand alongside our transgender and non-binary students. As in so many other situations, when we make changes that support one group of students, we make our schools better for all of our students. We call on Governor Yunkin and the Virginia Department of Education to drop this proposed update to the guidance for transgender and non-binary students. As one of many school divisions across the state and nation that are committed to affirming and supporting gender expansive students, Charlottesville City Schools would be happy to engage in a more productive conversation to promote mutual understanding with the caveat that our students' respect and safety are non-negotiable. As a reminder to everybody, Virginia is accepting public comment on the proposed due policy through Wednesday, October 26th. And this statement that I just read is on behalf of the entire school board. Thank you. So we are going to close public comment at this point. We do have another opportunity later in the meeting. Um, we are now moving on to student and staff recognitions. We will now have Dr. Odie. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Odie, good evening. Tonight I'm here to share our resolution first on Disability History and Awareness Month. Uh, you see it there on the screen. I believe you have it before you. More than a decade ago, a group of youth with disabilities requested that Virginia officially recognize October as Disability History and Awareness Month, D-H-A-M. These dedicated youth also developed a credo. Disability history, education, and awareness will promote positive attitudes in schools creating a culture of mutual respect, understanding, and equal opportunities for all. Before you, you will see our resolution. While I will not read every word from that resolution, it is important to note all that the General Assembly, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, the Virginia Department of Education, and Charlottesville City Schools has done and is doing to ensure that students with disabilities are included, 
do not experience discrimination, are fully supported, have the same high expectations as their non-disabled peers, and so much more. Last year, we served almost 600 students with disabilities here in Charlottesville City Schools. And our principals and teachers are committed to providing meaningful activities and equitable op opportunities for our students with disabilities. Our division is doing various things to celebrate Disability History and Awareness Month. Posters are, that have been donated by VCU will be distributed to schools to post on school bulletin boards. Workshops will be offered for teachers, administrators, and parents. These workshops will be distributed to building administrators and school-based special education staff to post on their learning platforms for, for parents to access. Resources provided by the VDOE will be posted in Canvas. Staff will be trained and, uh, on guidance documents on the development of IEPs on our October 26th Professional Learning Day. We are asking staff to wear yellow on October 19th to promote disability awareness for cognitive and intellectual disabilities. Also, Dr. Bracey, our supervisor of exceptional ed, is looking at yellow wristbands for staff with disability awareness printed on them. We're challenging all schools to do a daily announcement devoted to Disability History and Awareness Month. And forthcoming, we are in the planning stages of a Disability History and Awareness Month Harvest Festival. And we're soliciting community partners to set up information booths to distribute to parents. This may be the month assigned to Disability History and Awareness Month but we know that this work continues all year long. So this Disability History and Awareness Month resolu resolution is an action item. And I do ask that you take action today, but I stand ready for questions at this time. Did you say we're gonna try and kick off that fall festival this year? I'm sorry. I don't know that it's gonna happen <laughs> this year, Dr. Bracey said that it is forthcoming. Yeah. So as quickly as she can get it to happen, I um, think we'll a, be letting everybody know. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think there's probably to. a lot of partners that would love to join in on that. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Any questions, anybody else? We need to make a motion. Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to do that. Uh, I move um, approval of the resolution on uh, disability history and awareness month. 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. So now, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Gurley, I'd like to move on to our dyslexia awareness resolution. As Ms. Factor brings that up for us, I'd like to share that we do have a dyslexia advisor for our school division, Steph Tatel, who leads this effort. Our CCS elementary curriculum now includes explicit, systematic, and cumulative phonics instruction for every student. This tier one instruction is critical for preventing reading difficulties for all students, especially students with dyslexia. A recent VDOE superintendent's email highlights that the VDOE is offering informational webinars designed for Virginia teachers, administrators, and parents. Ms. Tatel has this information and will distribute it, but just a bit of information for you, uh, Dr. Tiffany Hogan is presenting recent findings on the language basis of dyslexia. That's a webinar that's happening in October. Dr. Sarah Seiko will be talking about families and schools partnering for children's literacy success, also happening in October. And the Virginia Joint Coalition of Learning Disabilities and Literacy presents two systematic re reviews analyzing four decades of reading inter intervention research for elementary students who are at risk for dyslexia. So that is also happening in October. 
Ms. Tatel also has several links that she can and will share with staff regarding two questions, three questions. How can I learn more about dyslexia? What is the science of reading? And what does the science of reading have to do with dyslexia? So our resolu resolution is there before you. And again, it is an action item. I ask that you take action tonight, and I am happy to answer questions at this time. Any questions, anybody? I, I just want to, um, as, as a parent of a student who is dyslexic or a, a young lady who is dyslexic, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, is a big reason of why I'm sitting here and, and as a big piece of my journey um, as far as my involvement with the schools. And um, I'm appreciative of, of where we're at with this. We've come a long way. And I'm, I'm grateful for the training that uh, universities will be pushing out, the Virginia Literacy Act, and we'll be hearing more about that. Um, is right around the corner. It's, it's never here fast enough, but we are as a division incorporating a lot of already what is best for all students, um, but especially students who, who struggle with, with reading and literacy. So this is exciting and thank you. Thank you. And lastly, I will share our 2022 bullying. We need, we need oh, a sorry. push on that, that's all right. Oh, I, yes. I waxed poetic <laughs> there. So if, if somebody would like to. Any second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So now I'll share our 2022 Bullying Prevention Proclamation. While I also won't read through this uh, proclamation word for word, I can't say enough how important bullying prevention is to us here in Charlottesville City Schools. We want each of our students to feel safe, to be safe. Taking steps to prevent bullying is a big part of that. As you can see here, almost 30% of students in the United States are estimated to be involved in bullying each year. And many students miss school each day due to a fear of being bullied in the United States. We know that bullying can happen verbally, physically, and over social media. So we must be prepared and vigilant in preventing bullying at all times. And we also have a policy that addresses bullying, policy JFCM. Our schools, our principals, our teachers, our counselors are vigilant about preventing bullying and so they have many activities that occur in October and truly all throughout the year to combat bullying behaviors. And so if Ms. Thacker can bring up the chart of activities by school, you will see that there's so many wonderful activities that our schools are doing to teach about and ward off bullying. For instance, we have the kindness character trait as a focus counselor support, conflict resolution, SEL lessons, lessons on the power of the upstander rather than the bystander. So saying something about it rather than just listening to it and not doing anything. Lunch bunches, actually defining what bullying is and having meaningful discussions about it and so much more. We strive to be a bully-free school division. And we want all of our schools to be bully-free zones. And so we will continue this important work. This proclamation is also an action item for you today. At this time, I'm happy to answer questions. Dr. Craig. Well, um, you know, this is one I, I agree with you, it's so important and it, I think it's something that does exist in our schools and not only our schools, but you know other school divisions as well. And um, I'm glad to see that there are all of these activities. Um, I guess I wonder how effective, uh, you know, are we, are we really being effective 
in the efforts that we are, are taking. Um, and I, my question actually, I was going to ask our Ms. Bird, our student representative, to share your perspective about bullying and whether there are any other kinds of um, actions that you feel the school division might take on this issue. that there are numerous uh, like policies and activities that um, are planned and uh, have like the idea of going through but I, I think there is at least at, at, at CHS speaking for uh, CHS I think there there is a block at some point um, where the, the sent message gets like diluted at some point and I think we're not quite getting as much of the communication about it as uh, uh, it sounds like uh, is intending to be sent. Um, also, in relation to this, I have drafted a survey, and it's in the uh, process of being a final approval from the department chairs at CHS, and uh, will hopefully be going about out next week. Um, it is very short, just like have uh, a few questions about uh, how prevalent it is at CHS and whether it affects the student or people they know and then any suggested uh, suggestions that they have for uh, CHS or the school system um, for how uh, the, our policies or communication can be improved. Anecdotally, do you hear about this from students about, about this issue? Do I hear about bullying? Is yes. It, um, I mean, yeah, it's definitely a prevalent issue at any school. And I think uh, it's sometimes overlooked at high schools because students are assumed to be able to handle themselves a little more. But I think it's definitely uh, still a community where students need a lot of support um, from, you know, adult intervention and uh, you know, just trusted adults. So I would say that, yes, I've, I've, um, it's definitely a prevalent issue. Anecdotally. Well, perhaps, um, you know, when you get the survey results, if there are any, um, any ideas, you know, that other students Absolutely. or yourself if, that you have, if you could bring those to our, to the school board, that would be really appreciated. Absolutely. That's, that's yes. the idea. But in, in conclusion, I think just like communication is the most important thing, because I think that's, I think the biggest issue is that at some point I can hear the message that we're trying to send. Um, and I think just at some point that message is getting uh, stopped or at least slowed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I say all these things, just, I just want to make sure that, you know, the, the, you know, that what we're doing is really having the intended impact that we want it to have. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, board members? All right. Motion, please. This is an action item as well. So moved. Can we get a second on this? All right. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next up, we have um, the adoption of our consent agenda. Um, for the public, just for if you don't have an agenda in front of you, this includes um, personnel recommendations, our business, financial, and routine reports, and approval of our 2022-2023 advisory committees to the school board. Anybody have any comments about that? Madam Chair. There was uh, one issue in the consent agenda regarding personnel, the personnel agenda. I would like to, I guess we could amend or clarify um, in regards to the lead teachers. Um, if we can pull that out of the consent agenda. Thank you. 
There was two areas. There was just some duplication that we're, we're correcting. So based on the correction, we can continue as normal then. Is that correct? I think we just stay with the existing modifications. Okay. So I, I move that we approve the consent agenda with the modifications um, regarding the lead teacher staff. And I second. Thank you. My, my only comment about this in regards to advisory committees is to, um, for the special ed advisory committee, I would love to um, see more elementary parents being reached out to. Um, trying to engage. I mean, we do have an, a nice list of parents there, but I felt like maybe only, although there is a parent that's got multiple students at each level, but just to make sure that, that we're doing some outreach to each of those elementary schools. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. All right, and next we move on to our action items, sir. All right, we will start with, uh, we will start with Dr. Beth, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. <laughs> we will start with Ms. Hoover, who will um, bring us the budget calendar. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Gurley, and school board members. Um, before you, you have the uh, proposed budget calendar uh, for the 2023-2024 uh, budget year. Uh, this calendar was pre presented to you last month. Um, there has not been any changes to it, and we've already begun with our um, budget uh, survey. If there's any um, questions, comments, can you just remind everybody that budget survey was pushed out to everybody, correct? Yes, it was pushed out to our teachers, our students, our staff, our community members, anybody that we could reach. And what is the deadline on that? Uh, it was September 29th. So it's, it's over? It's closed, yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you feel like you got sufficient uh, input? We did. Um, a report will be coming back to the, the school board uh, in Dr. Gurley's report uh, next week, and then we'll be discussing it at the uh, budget work session on October 20th. I believe we got about 429, 27. 430 30. some responses, yes. Yeah, so, and, and to our student rep, were you aware? So do we have another opportunity for students or how would you encourage Dr. Gurley students to weigh in on that at this point, if there's an interest? Well, I guess we could formalize, we could formalize the, we could compile the data we already have and if we need to um, drop it just for this, if we want to drop it for the um, students here at CHS, if they have an interest to complete it, I mean, that can be, just so that we can make sure we compile the data we already have. Um, but I mean, but if students have an interest, we can we can show you what they think. But I, I don't want to um, I don't want to slow down. Yeah. Right. And 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 one of our slides is the demographic group that actually responded to it. Yes. So we will have those responses of students who did get it. And if it's a low response, we can may yeah. reconsider right. sending we, it out. We did have students to complete the survey. It just was it wasn't at the same rate, of course, as parents and teachers. And I guess what I would say, especially, yeah, you know, I'll take your comment on is to take a look at this calendar, um, which is our budget development calendar uh, up on the screen right now. And there are lots of opportunities for community members and and always we are we will take input and and emails. So, even if you were say to add one more question <laughs> to your survey that you're sending out to your classmates, you know, or just to encourage them if, if there's things that they would like to share, 
either through you or, or to show up at one of our meetings. Oops, go ahead. I just had a, a question. Uh, how was the, the survey pushed out? What, what was the platform? And where can I expect to look for surveys like this in the future and, and spread the word um, about that? I believe it was pushed out via of email. We yeah, pushed it out via the email to everyone. Um, not sure whether it was on our website, um, but the main course was email. Okay. So it pushed out via email, so you would have to register to receive updates from the schools to receive those surveys, correct? That would be a Beth Chuck kind of, I think she's back there. I, I think uh, I think the main thing I'm hearing now is uh, the students are not receiving all the messages that parents see. And this is something students have been telling us for a little while. And one of the ways, I, I, I can't speak to how we can solve this problem exactly. Um, there are a lot of messages that get pushed out through Canvas, for instance, and I'm not, I can't speak to whether this one was or this one wasn't, but even if it did get out, pushed out to Canvas, that's only one way to reach students. Uh, we do have a committee who have been reviewing some of our communications tools, and one of the factors we are looking at as we look at communications tools is whether it can, the messages can go not only to staff, not only to adult family members, but to the students themselves because I have noticed over the past few years that we do have a fair number of students reach out to me directly or reach out to my colleagues in, in communication and say, my mom actually doesn't read your emails. How can I get the emails? Uh, and so I think that in a more lasting solution, adopting a new tool that can help us speak directly to students, some of whom will read our emails and some of whom won't, or some of whom will check the text messages and some of whom won't. But I think that's the lasting solution. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, so this is an action item. I'll move uh, uh, approval of the budget calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. We will now have Denise Johnson, who will um, come up for our second reading of the um, West Haven community assignment. And this is an action item. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Gurley. At the September 1st meeting, Beth Chuck shared with you the request for students who live in the West Haver neighborhood to be permanently assigned to their neighborhood school of Venable. This evening, I'm asking that the board vote to approve the proposal, which continues the transitional work we began in 2019. Once the policy is approved, we will begin meeting with families who currently attend Berlin Moran. And as we continue these conversations with families and community in the community, we will proactively monitor the ways that we can support our families and schools with the transition. I move the approval of this plan. <laughs> uh, second. Any questions or comments? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Oh. Thank you, everybody, for your work on this. All right. Now, items for discussion. We have Dr. Baptist, who will give us an update on the school naming committee. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Um, I'm going to see if Ms. she's come. Uh, we have had a committee, Naming of Facilities Committee, that started back in the fall of 2020, just about the same time COVID did, and we did have some meetings, we had some discussions, we had some uh, some smaller community meetings, and we, we didn't get very far with it. There was a lot going on in our community. Since that time, we have dealt with this minor thing called COVID. Uh, we have welcomed a new superintendent. 
And we've also been talking a lot about reconfiguration. But we want to get back on this task because this is something that a lot of people have been doing in the country and we want to at least visit and make sure we're doing what our community wants. So if um, you have received in the packet and eligible or available to the community, a longer version of what the process is proposed to be for this year. But I'm just gonna highlight a few things on the screens tonight. So we did have the committee that started back in 2020 and Phil Varner, who is a community member and a parent in our schools has done so much research about all the backgrounds of schools. And I found it fascinating when I was reading it because I had been with the city schools for quite a few years at that time and didn't know all of the background of various schools. So we've used that as a guide to, to get us going. Um, sometime in 21, we decided that we would approach this based on schools chronologically as they were either last named or originally named. And rather than just picking one and say, we're gonna start here. So the first two that we have talked about and doing anything about are Venable and Clark Elementary. And next slide. So what we're looking at is a process to do two schools at one time and try to get through all of the elementary schools during this school year, and then see kind of where we are with the reconfiguration or the plans for Walker Buford and anything with the high school for next year. So we did have a meeting with our um, committee in the week of, I think it was September 20th, and then with Beth Chuck's help, a survey was done or completed, and that was posted on the 23rd of September on our website. It's also been shared with several community members to share with their uh, groups or their other committee members. And so far, as of this afternoon, as of five minutes ago, we've had 147 responses to the survey, and the responses have been very interesting. They've been all over the map. And some very much want the names to stay the same. Some very much want the names to change. Uh, just as Alexanne had, some have made recommendations, um, both for Clark and for Venable. So it's it's going to be very interesting to see where a lot of the information lands. But we will have the community forum on October the 19th from 5 to 7. Um, Alexanne mentioned that, and you and community can sign up for that on our web page. It's prominently displayed about the survey and about the forum. After the forum, the committee will get back together look at all the information that we have from the survey and from the forum and try to whittle it down to some recommendations. I'm not saying it's gonna be one recommendation, it's gonna be two recommendations or what it will be, but we will be whittling it down. And then we'll come back to you at the board meeting on November the 3rd as a um, discussion item. And then if you have any questions or things that the committee needs to go back and look at, we will. And then it would come back to you on December the 1st for, as a recommendation for you to decide either to keep the name as it is or to change the name for the school. So that is sort of the process. And if you look at the next slide, the next two schools, based on the chronological naming of the, of the schools, would then be Johnson and Burnley Moran. So we would follow a very similar process, post a survey as soon as we come back from the holidays, have a community forum, have the committee meet again, whittle it down, bring it to you February 2nd for a, a vote of some sort on March the 2nd. And then once we finish that one, we would go to the next one. Next slide, please. Look at Greenbrier. Now Jackson Via is out of order. Jackson Via would not normally be the next school, but we wanted to put Walker Buford and the high school together. So we moved Jackson Via up and this way we will be looking at all elementary schools during this year. So we would start in March with the survey, community forum the week after spring break. Um, committee will meet again, whittle down, bring a recommendation to you on May 4th, and then hopefully the board can make a decision by June 1st. So this process, it's is pretty intense, but it will keep us going. And by having dates already on here, now we may have to change a date or two, a day or two but this gives us a plan to work throughout the year. And we will, of course, be bringing information to the board on many meetings throughout the, the year to either get input or to ask for a decision. So I would ask if you have any questions. No, thank you. I mean, I'm glad, glad we got this. I know we've had a lot of things that have interrupted it. So thank you for sticking with it. 
and getting it rolling. And just as a reminder, we have board members part of that committee. We have two board members, Dr. Kraft and Mr. Bryant. And I apologize to both of them publicly. Somehow, when I did copy and paste for the names, your names were not where I had them, but I've gotten you back in there. So you can fuss at me now or later. <laughs> <laughs> no fussing. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to not have to have a major COVID update, but we again appreciate all your ongoing behind the scenes work with that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. We will now have a, um, an equity and family engagement update by Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> so funny. I love it. We're going to trademark it again. <laughs> so good evening again, Madam Chair school board, and Dr. Gurley. As always, I want to take a moment to thank you for your ongoing support and affirmation of our equity work. We are here this evening with a few updates. Thank you. Next slide for me. First, we wanted to introduce you to the new office of Johnson & Johnson. No, the new office of equity and engagement. The Office of Equity and Engagement is comprised of our equity team and our family, school, and community engagement team. Our engagement team has also adopted a new acronym, FACE, which stands for Family and Community Engagement. You will hear and see that as part of our new engagement materials. Together, we have four large areas of focus, including equity Center professional learning and development, meaningful engagement, organizing and implementing a strong volunteer program, and maintaining open and effective partnerships with our community organizations. Secondly, I wanted to tell you about our new professional learning program. This year, we will have three levels of equity-focused professional learning. All of our professional learning will align with the mission for Charlottesville City Schools, our equity definition, and our equity goals. It will also focus on the four domains of the Virginia Department of Education Standard 6 Cultural Competency. Our new equity certificate program, which is our highest level of equity, equity focused learning, is open to all staff. In order to receive the certificate and 90 professional learning points, they must fully participate in all of the monthly professional learning lessons. This includes the preparation, attending the session, completing the written homework, engaging in independent practice, and attending the reflection session. We will also have an intermediate level and a basic level for those who have different levels of availability, but still want to explore those topics. Our initial learning lessons begin in August, and we will have a quick information session on October 13th for those who want to participate in the equity certificate program. Here's a list of our topics on this slide. And all of our, our all of our sessions will be facilitated by a content area expert. Good evening, Madam Chair, School Board, and Dr. Gurley. My name is Bianca Johnson, second part of Johnson and Johnson. I'm the Family Engagement Coordinator for Charlottesville City Schools. And within the recent name change, ongoing and focused engagement, as well as partnerships, is still the core of our work and our contribution to student success. Community engagement allows us to continue to meet families where they are. It also allows us to connect and provide support when needed. In partnerships with the schools and the communities, we're able to identify the strengths within both of the families and the communities that we can tap into. All of these efforts are done with the intention to eliminate barriers to student success. The FACE team summer was similar to the summers before, as in we spent a lot of time connecting with many local organizations in hopes to join efforts already in place versus working to create new ones. As the family engagement coordinator, I also work to support families who attended summer school to help um, better navigate the process, including Power School and the YMCA Power Scholars registrations during home visits. Of course, a big piece of our face work is coordination of events as needed. We supported the back to school bash where over a thousand backpacks and supplies were given out in less than an hour, and that was in August. I also attended and collaborated with the community for events such as Friendship Court's back to school event, Venable's pop-up meet and greets within the West Haven community. FACE has also had opportunities for community building and family empowerment for both of our CCS families and staff. 
The first family university on the Virginia tiered systems of support was held on September 8th. We normally brand family university as virtual workshop series for families. However, in an effort to be more inclusive, we open attendance to staff and community partners, such as our YMCA staff that run our after school programs in our buildings to learn more about our processes within the division. There was another tailgate open to all CCS staff and families on September 8th to connect with partners. Our new CHS principal, Mr. Pitt, have dinner and play games. They ended the evening by cheering on the Black Knights at their game against Spotswood. We've also started our monthly morning community meet and greets. The next one will be this Tuesday over in Friendship Court. One of the community engagement efforts that I felt was the most important in the last few months was the support with the transportation transitions that we've experienced this school year. We're all very aware of our changes in the walk zones, our bus driver shortage. In an effort to make families aware of the changes and get some feedback from them, we scheduled talk and walk sessions with Dr. Gurley. And at these sessions, we made families aware of other opportunities for students to get to school, such as carpooling with others in the neighborhood and riding city transit. At the start of the school year, we had an all hands on deck approach to make sure that we were all out and all as in central office staff, division annex staff, all of us. Um, we were all serving as crossing guards, greeters, walking buses and connectors to additional information. I personally walked with Buford students to and from Friendship Court and rode bus nine many times to connect with students and families that are using public transit. There were some families that I connected with that had concerns about public transit. And what I found in most cases is that they just didn't have the knowledge about how it works. So I appreciate the firsthand perspective as it allows me to experience what the families and the students do on a daily to get to school. And as the year progresses, we look forward to continuing to provide direct support as needed, coordinating events, as well as maintaining our community partnerships to support our CCS students and families. We are so excited about the work that we're doing. As we all know, people will forget what you said, people for will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And our ongoing goal is to make everyone feel valued, seen, and heard. So if anyone has any additional questions, or ideas, we welcome them to reach out to us at any time. And thank you all again for your time this evening. Any questions? Thank you both so much for everything. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, next up, we have a transportation update by Ms. Kim Powell. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Um, so this evening, I just wanna make sure Leslie's finished doing her thing with, oops, went too far. There we go. So driver update for this evening. Um, as of September 29th, and these numbers are still true today um, for the most part, we had eight pupil drivers, including two lead drivers, two cat drivers helping out at that time, nine bus routes running per tier, and our tiers are elementary, Walker Buford, that middle tier, and then high. And so that means we have seven regular routes and we have to have two bus drivers running alternative routes during the um, elementary and middle times. And then when we go get to the high school, by that time we have eight regular routes and then we have one route running students to alternative placements. And then we, I'm very happy to report, we have four drivers in training. One driver who is now to the point where they're out with the experienced drivers, sort of behind the wheel, if you will, and three completed the classroom portion. And we did so in record time with great efficiency. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And I was pleased to hear that, at, and this is before the recent action from council, we already had uh, as many as four additional drivers in various stages of the um, application and onboarding process. So this is really great news. Um, our new route set will start on November the 9th. And to be clear, this is gonna be such a big change with, the, with route expansion that it's gonna be like starting a new school year. So even for students who currently have a bus assignment, your bus stop may change, your bus stop time may change, your, um, the, the um, bus color may change because to we have routes now that are not running very efficiently in order to get our highest need, 
highest priority students who have no other way to school. As we add routes, we wanna make those routes as efficient as possible. And um, so we're really excited about this opportunity. But from a routing standpoint, November 9th is like a first day of school. So our families will be getting a lot of communication. We'll be getting the communications as we get closer to that date. That's a Wednesday following that two day break. Um, that's when the new routes will go in effect, new routes set. Um, our wait lists are dynamic. We're working them frequently doing what we call swaps for students who aren't using their seats. Other students may need it. You know, there's a lot of activity. We're not doing nothing until November 9th as we're developing the new routes. Um, but I can tell you that looking at the numbers, um, each tier, elementary, middle, and high, should have well under 100 students remaining on who are waiting for to get a seat on a bus. So that's going to be... Um, uh, that's going to be the best situation we've had since the pandemic. So um, this is very exciting. Um, I th think it's going to be worth all the hard work and wait, and I hope our families um, really experience a lot of relief from this. So uh, This is just a glimpse of the new online training that we have set up through Canvas. And I want to give a special thanks again to Jessica Brantley from our CCS coordinator team. She's a health and PE coordinator, and she actually teaches here at the high school as well. She jumped in and just started pouring content into Canvas to develop this, this course. Share Eubanks with People Transportation. It, it's public knowledge in general, so I'm going to make sure you're all aware. She is really, really retiring in December. And so along with that, Dave Dillahunt and his team from the city have been videoing this current cohort of uh, students going through training with so that so we're capturing uh, this this final chapter of Sherry's driver training and we'll we'll be polishing that and incorporating that into the um, online course as well. So just a lot really this is a great new tool. This will this is also going to be key for our own employees, especially those who work as coaches, to help them get through that classroom training part so that then we can, it'll be easier just to coordinate their behind the wheel part because we do have a reasonable cohort of our own staff who want to drive to at least help out with athletics and so forth and field trips. Super excited about that. This tool is gonna to really help streamline that for us. A few other quick notes because transportation is about more than buses for us now, for sure. Um, we do have uh, two school staffed walking school bus groups. It's actually multiple groups, but we are operating successful school bus walking groups uh, serving Clark families coming from Friendship Court and serving Venable families coming from West Haven. And I, um, those have been going very well. Um, our crossing guard coverage has more than doubled from last year. Special thanks to Mr. Jason Lee for all of his hard work getting people and, and helping to get that program, taking it to a new level, really. And we're very grateful for our crossing guard team. They're, they're really, um, there was a picture in the Johnson & Johnson presentation of one of our great crossing guards. And, um, and then bike and pedestrian infrastructure improvements. We still meet um, every Thursday with Brennan Duncan from the city. And a lot of work has been done and you can still see that on our website, but um, the work does continue. The things that are remaining now are more, a little more complex, a little more costly, but um, that's still a place people can look at, you know, where we're, what's been done and where we're going, continuing to work with the city to uh, make bike and pedestrian infrastructure improvements. Remind everyone the MyCville app is a great way to report infrastructure concerns. There's also a form that's available from our website forward slash transportation. If you see a safety concern, um, they have a, actually a reporting form that's on the city's website, but our page can get you to all of that. Um, this was also mentioned during um, the earlier presentation from the family uh, engagement team. Our families, our students are catching the cat. Um, it, it's working, it's helping. Um, Dr. Gurley was a big part of that, a family engagement team, a big part of helping students um, and our community allies have been really just helping to bring this resource uh, forward to make it more of an option for our families. CHS is on the number nine pink route. Buford is actually served pretty well by red and yellow routes, routes four and six. It's still fare, for, fare free. Um, and so we hope that that uh, will continue to grow and improve as a resource for all of our community and of course, especially our students. So to wrap up, I'm always reflecting about this journey we've been on with transportation. 
and back in September of 2020, you know, it's like, how do we make it work? What's our least imperfect set of solutions? And we moved past that at the beginning of this past summer. And we said, can we move forward as a community with a new solution set? And I'm really happy to say together, we absolutely can move forward and we are moving forward with a different solution set that I think is gonna be more sustainable for all of us um, for what lies ahead. So thanks to everyone who supported this work. The work certainly continues. Happy to answer questions. Dr. Kraft. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, how, do we have any idea how many students are taking the CAT buses? So we don't have any official numbers on that. I know the pink bus that's going to Walker is has quite a few um, students. That that route in particular. Um, but I can work with Cat. I've asked. We've asked that question. I don't have any official numbers, but um, I can certainly try to get some. It just might be helpful to mm -hmm. get a sense of that because yeah. I've heard really good things about how that's working. Yep. Yeah. Um, and my one other question is about the small buses, the yes. A buses, and. Is there an update on that? <laughs> yeah, uh, March, April. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I hope they come in when they say they will. Um, supply chain continues to be an issue for us, even with just electronics for door controls and stuff. So, I, I, you know, I, I will continue to stay that to stay to say March, April, which is what we were told when we ordered. Um, but I'm also kind of trying to manage my expectations. We're excited. We'll be very excited to put those into use as soon as we get them, and then we'll need to be continually looking at what's our next step, what's our next move, how many more of those would make sense. Any other questions, comments, Ms. Byrne? No. Um, thank you, as always. But can I, sorry. I left it, you thank you, sorry. Slipped, <laughs> you kind of slipped it in, but I think it's kind of big news to kind of, as far as what the city put out. Yes, um, I'll be happy to talk about it. So they uh, announced just this week, I believe it went into effect Monday, um, $21 an hour is the new starting base rate for full-time driver. And the existing drivers all had a 12% action from where they were. So um, if I'm not mistaken, and again, I have to be careful because I don't stay right on top, but I, 21 was is the highest rate I've heard for our, our, our area as a starting rate. So we're super excited about that. We still meet weekly. I mean, um, the infrastructure work, the transportation work, um, we have a new, uh, new security safety meetings happening weekly. Um, there's a lot of things to do, but the, the work is really, um, we're making progress. It's all incremental, but that's a big step on the city's part. Yeah, thank you for mm -hmm. sharing that out again. And I do wanna just say thank you to Dr. Gurley and, and you all who are having those weekly meetings and thank you to the city and um, for, for taking that action to help support our students and, and community members. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. We have um, Beth Chuck, who I think stepped out. So I can step in. She stepped out, I can step in. <laughs> you can or I can do it. She's juggling today's news. So as we're waiting for her, um, the next topic is um, our proposed legislative priorities. And just I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit that we will have our delegate and senator meeting with us later this month to go over um, local priorities or what we as a school board um, hold as priorities for legislation in the upcoming year, so. And we have Ms. Chuck. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I hope you haven't been waiting. I was out with uh, a member of the media, uh, but thank you for having me. And um, I think we're really just, uh, for, for people watching this school board meeting, this is the time of year that we either monitor what's going on statewide in terms of legislative priorities of other school divisions. And we get those recommendations from agencies like the Virginia School Board, or the Virginia Education Association. And so we were generally in alignment with those recommendations. And I think uh, Mrs. Th uh, Ms. Thacker uh, tucked some of those that have come in already into the document that's posted here. And it's also a time that we as staff 
do our own brainstorming, excuse me, about issues that are important to us or where we might get some legislative assistance on um, clearing up some log jams about some things that might, might, have a, might have a legislative solution. And so we meet with our local electeds, uh, Senator Cree Deeds and Delegate Sally Hudson, and we talk about these issues and they tell us what they're hearing from, other, uh, from their peers. And they ask us, how can we help in Charlottesville? And we are very lucky. We've always traditionally had very strong supporters of education representing us. And they've also been ad big advocates for our goals here in Charlottesville. So uh, we did uh, share this list of uh, items that are top of mind for us. And I don't wanna review them uh, in detail here, but we did give a brief summary here. And uh, they're just truly just looking, as you know, the, the, for instance, the special sales tax that is going to be well known to all of you and anyone who followed the legislative sessions last year, that's to give local voters, not just in Charlottesville, but across the state, the chance to approve a 1% sales tax in favor of school construction. So that, that did fairly well in the legislative session last year, but did not do well enough to uh, get approved. So uh, uh, entering into that process again would be a top priority for all of us. Finding uh, just, uh, this is an area where our previous local electeds were able to very effectively help us in the past. And a very similar issue has arisen with aftercare, the transitional period of uh, when school stops and the YMCA's aftercare starts. There's a little bit of a headache about the uh, staffing requirements there. So again, we're hoping for a sort of a legislative exemption to smooth over that. Another uh, issue that we've seen and heard of is the idea of second chance hiring for certain felons who nonviolent who might be a good fit for positions like custodians or like school bus drivers. And uh, because again, we have some, there's, there's legislation that prevents us from even considering that policy. So uh, we just want to, this is a big movement nationally in a variety of fields. And we just wonder if there's an opportunity uh, within the school setting. And then uh, lastly, on school transportation, this really gets back to those um, issues. That, again, that they made progress on this on the state level last year, but we would like to see more progress for, um, for not having the CDL, for driving a slightly bigger type A bus, and for using an, a non-yellow, the, the, the expense comes in when you buy a bus that has been tricked out for school purposes. So if we could use a non-yellow activity bus for greater purposes, that would, that would be a big cost savings, not just for us, but for other schools across, across the state. So those are some of the bigger issues. And I think the other ones are sort of self-explanatory in, in many areas. I don't, I don't need to go through all these, but the salary increases, just simply that one is, um, when the state does salary increases, we totally appreciate it, but often they do it limited to the standard of quality positions and not only we, but I think virtually every school division in the state hire well beyond the standard of quality positions. So those staff raises, when they're tied to the exact number of positions that are generated by a formula, don't actually cover all of our staff. And the local schools have to come up with the extra for that. And then uh, finally, the fact-finding panel for grievances and dismissals. I'm not, I don't have as much uh, clarity around that one, but I think Prior to 2013, school divisions had sort of two options for handling this. And starting in 2013, those options were narrowed down to one. And so I think uh, the, the, the request is to go back to, the, to a place of giving school divisions two options for addressing grievances. The others, I think, are very, they're straight out of VSBA. And again, we have traditionally been in sync with the requests that come in from other state organizations. And not only that, but our local electeds have historically been very supportive of those statewide uh, requests as well. So usually when we have those meetings, we don't spend a lot of time on the statewide ones. They're more curious about which ones are actually emerging from Charlottesville or from Albemarle that they can take forth. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any okay. questions? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, and the next item was board response to written reports, and that's um, a list that board members um, contribute to, just to let everybody know the different committees and activities that we've been involved in, and that's posted. And then 
we are now to our next opportunity for comments from members of the community. So we'll start again with anybody here in the media center. If you would like to make comment, please feel free to step forward to the podium. Please state your name, your address, and remember you have three minutes for your comments, please. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Janet Driscoll Miller. I am a resident, I'm actually an out of district parent, and I have two children in the Charlottesville City Schools at Charlottesville High School, one in ninth grade and one in 12th grade. I'm here to speak to you tonight because I'm very concerned in part that we don't even have this on the agenda this evening, that uh, we need to speak about the recent lockdowns that, were, that occurred in September at CHS. Thankfully, thankfully, these were false alarms. However, we have not done enough as a school group, as a school, as parents, as a community to address these issues. So I wanna tell you, convey to you what I have heard from students and other parents about these lockdowns and what occurred and what we feel is missing. So there are two main points I wanna to talk to you about tonight. One is safety drills and the other is the safety of the facility itself. So number one, uh, of course, we wanna keep our students safe. The first issue is that students came home and told me, my students and other students, told me that uh, stories about what happened on those days. Uh, when I took a look at what the safety protocols were, um, I took a look at the EC, EB, EC, EBCB safety drill information in the school board policy, which stated that students and employees have to have safety procedures and drills at least once per year. And then further, there was a safety protocol update in May and June of this year that was approved by the school board that said there should be at least four lockdown drills per year. As of this date, and the first quarter is almost done, we have not had a lockdown drill to my knowledge at CHS. According to my students that I have talked to, there has not been a lockdown drill. As you can imagine, that's pretty difficult for kids who are new to the school and don't necessarily know all of the emergency routes the way they should. So that needs to occur immediately. Um, additionally, the documentation in the safety protocols that were adopted in May and June of this year by the school board refer to the run, hide, fight from ready.gov, which is the typical uh, information that most people are given about active shooters in situations where they're in a, a building or a community. However, I don't think that we're using this consistently because I heard a story of a frightened ninth grader who specifically asked to flee the school uh, and go to the woods because he had a safe path to do so. And he was told no by his teacher that he could not flee the school. Uh, that does not fit with those guidelines. So I do not feel we're being consistent in our guidelines and teaching, which makes those drills very, very important. What CCS is promoting to school, to teachers and students differs in some ways than what parents are hearing. So we need to have consistency in what that protocol is so we as parents can make sure our children are well, well prepared for this as well. Secondly, I wanna talk about the safety audits um, of the schools, the facilities themselves. So annually CCS and CPD do safety audits of our schools. And they are, that is in, 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 con, in accordance with the code of Virginia. So it's a state law that we have to do so. From what I understood, the last one was done in the spring. And in talking with students, uh, again, who were in this situation and other discussions with parents who talked with Principal Pitt, I don't believe that an audit has been done during this particular school year. And what we found was that students told us there were multiple points of failure, including but not limited to the fact that teachers cannot lock, in some cases, their own uh, classroom during a drill. They do not have a key to do so. Substitutes do not have a key to lock the classroom in one of those situations. That is a point of failure that we can control. In closing, as a CHS parent, I request that the school board provide us within two weeks of today's date as parents, the following information. Number one, a date on which to expect a completed safety audit of CHS, given that we have had three lockdowns in the past month. 
And I'd like to know the findings. Where are the failures? What can we do as a community to help fix them? Parents should expect this information in writing and available to them either by request or sent home with students. Second, a set date for an active shooter drill at Charlottesville High School, where teachers and students alike are taught how to respond in this emergency situation and to take the appropriate routes to flee the school. Right now, according to the protocols that were set in May and June, we have 11 fire drills a year and only four lockdown drills. There yeah. were zero fires at Charlottesville High School last year. Ma'am, you're out Yet of time, but so if you can finish yeah, your but points, But we prepare please. more for fires than we do for active shooters. That is not okay. We need to reevaluate that. So let's reevaluate that too. And a copy of standard action or shooter protocol so that parents can help their students understand at home the appropriate actions to take as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello, Ms. Hi. Hello. So just to um, give a different parent perspective, um, I am also the parent of a Charlottesville High School student. My name is Becca Saxon. And I, like, I, I think there's certainly some things that could be tightened up. And I've had some conversation um, with Ms. Chuck. And I think some of my concerns have been passed on um, to the appropriate places to get some resolution. I worry that if we send all of the protocol to parents, like there has been so much information out there um, after the shooting that happened in Michigan last year the, and, and, it, and the aftermath of Parkland, the more people know what the protocol is, the easier it is for bad actors to figure out how to circumvent that protocol. Um, and so it's a fine line between how much do you practice and how much do you keep to yourselves in the interest of security for the teachers and the students who will be living through that. Um, so I don't know, I, I also know that there's a, so many reports of staff being traumatized from some of the ways that we do active shooter drills around the country. Um, the last thing we need is because these, most of these school shootings, which are exceedingly rare, are actually students who are either current students or recent students in the buildings. The last thing we need is to get it deeper into teachers' minds that they should be afraid of students. It will, it dramatically impacts how they build relationships with the students. It dramatically impacts academic achievement. The more we focus on this. Um, and so I trust that there are experts out there who know what you need to do and um, that you all have the ability to follow the experts and not get swayed by what parents in a moment of crisis are asking for. I think we can easily end up um, going too far in the other direction and actually causing more harm. So we need, we may need some common sense. I think we do need some common sense um, safety upgrades still, but I don't wanna see us swing the pendulum too far in the other direction. So thank you. Um, I, I have been impressed with what we have seen this year as a parent um, and have tremendous confidence despite all of the bumps that we have had this year. I have tremendous confidence that my son is in good hands. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the media center? And do we have anybody online? Yeah, we do have. Uh... Oh, sorry. One more person. Please state your name, address, and three minutes, please. Hi there. Andrew Manning, physics teacher at CHS. So I was there for the lockdown. I think what I'm here to talk to you about very quick, and I have three minutes, so I'm not going to use all of it, is just to kind of give you a heads up. 
the staff at CHS right now is kind of at a crossroads. The last month has been a disaster. There's no other way to put it. Now, depending on who you talk to, they'll put it in different lights. But I'm having conversations with staff where there are two different ways you have a conversation with staff member you don't really know. You look in the hallway and say, Friday, right? And they're like, thank God. That's one conversation. The other one is you look each other in your eye and you say, oh my gosh. And right now it is October 6th and we are all at that level. That is a problem. For whatever reason, this year has been way more chaotic than it usually feels. There has been a tremendous amount of lack of conversation. It has felt like there's a lot of people that aren't sure what to be doing. The lockdown was a really good example of that. And I understand in both cases, the concerns of wanting to do more drills and less drills. I think what we need to make sure we're doing is we're doing consistent drills. There were multiple teachers that did not know how to do a lockdown. The key thing is a huge issue. There are multiple teachers that can't lock their doors. These are basic things that need to be met. As professionals, we don't ask it, we expect it. Safety must be something we can expect when we walk in here. And that does not mean that we expect that everything will be calm and orderly, because that's not how high school works. But it is something where we understand that if there is a situation when we go into lockdown, we know what to do. If someone calls the school, we are ready to answer. And right now, a lot of staff members feel like that is not going to happen. I'm not sure if I'm going to answer right now if I call the office. And whether it is a manpower issue, it is that we have people who are very traumatized from that lockdown who have not felt safe coming back to school. We need to fix that. So that is the challenge that I lay for all of you right now. There is a budding crisis at CHS between staff morale and confidence. We know y'all can do the work, but you have to rise to the challenge here. Please show it to us. Because right now, there are quite a few people that are not quite sure if they're coming back next year. And after losing 20 teachers last year, that is a lot of institutional knowledge that's walking out the door if we let 20 more go. So that's what I'd leave with y'all today. Keep doing the great work you're doing, but don't forget about us and all that we've been through the past month so far. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Como online. Yep. So we do have two people uh, ready to speak. I have Tr Katrina Cooper listed. So Katrina, you've been promoted to be able to speak and all you need to do is unmute and you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katrina Cooper and I live over on Riverside Avenue. And I do have a daughter that goes to um, Charlottesville High School. So um, I wanna talk today about, excuse me, about the situations that has been going on at the high school with the lockdowns and all of that extra stuff. Um, first, I had to find out through social media first. And I figured that was a problem. Um, I called the school. Of course, I probably knew that the lines was going to be tied up because I wasn't the only parent that was calling. But um, I just want to say that my main concern, and I guess other people's concerns, is the safety of their children. And um, like the first speaker said, I think y'all need to do more drills and um, practice. And I also called because they said that you could call to the school and um, speak to um, a, mental, a mental health counselor. And when I called um, the number, um, it was someone, I wanna say at the superintendent's office, but I was redirected back to the guidance counselor. They made me feel that it was actually someone in the, the first person that I spoke with made me feel like it was actually someone in the mental health field to, you know, talk to my daughter about the situation. But it was the guidance counselor. That was fine. But I was just thinking it was somebody more with the, you know, education of what was going on. And um, my next thing was that
Ms. Cooper, I think we've, I don't know if you've muted yourself on your end. Um, I do not see her in the attendees list. It looked like there's a disconnect somewhere. Okay. So Ms. Cooper, if you can hear us, if you want to call back in or, and, and we're happy to link you back in. Um, next on the list, the name listed is Dee Dee Smith. Dee Dee, you've been uh, promoted. You should be able to unmute and speak at this time. Thank you. Um, this is Dee Dee Smith. I live in the Fry Springs neighborhood. Uh, and um, I would like to speak about something completely different. And that was uh, concerning your last meeting, which I very much appreciated. Uh, it was the first time I've ever heard y'all um, speak in one voice about the tragedy of the achievement gap and uh, something that I'm well known to um, be vocal about. But I, I, I'd like to actually tell you just a little bit of a personal story to uh, emphasize what I will sort of end up with a potential solution. And that is I'm from a family of five children from a relatively affluent white family outside Detroit. And uh, three of us did quite well in school, um, but my older brother and my younger brother didn't. And uh, back in the 50s and 60s, there weren't a lot of the resources we have today. There wasn't a lot of the conversation. In fact, it's something people didn't talk about. Uh, my older brother was a great athlete. He did well in high school, but um, was dead by 40. And my younger brother, who wasn't athletic, but had a knack for mechanics, has become quite a successful engineer because my parents knew how to deal with that resource. My father was an engineer. And um, I just want to postulate that 40% of my white, relatively well-off family um, failed to thrive in our American public education system. And uh, I don't think that's a far off from the norm, but you don't see that in your schools. When you see that white children are doing very well and children of color are not, we attribute it to poverty, we attribute it to lack of books. So we have lots and lots of reasons. And I just would like to, to suggest that it's because we are not set up in our American education to deal with a relatively normal lack of thriving to uh, achieve, to academically achieve. Am I suggesting, and I think the reason is you see the families in this community who are white have resources and they find resources for their private resources for their children or they take their children out of your school system. Am I suggesting you provide those private resources for children of color who may come from families who don't? Yes, I am. I actually am because I think it is the only way that we will address this huge gap, this tragedy of children not being able to learn to read. It's, it's, is to go to the professionals who know how to deal with it. I appreciate your time and I um, thank you for everything you do. Thank you. We have her back. Right. Ms. Cooper, you are, there you are back on our screen. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay. But um, yeah, like I was saying that the fact that they had, um, and it was the guidance counselor, that my daughter spoke with, I thought it was somebody else in the, in, in the better field. And also it was something else that I wanted to say. Um, over at Charlottesville High School, I believe they, I mean, they tell that, I know phones are a distraction, but like when you can't get in contact with nobody and nobody's getting in contact with you at a time like this, I don't think they should have the children put their phones in, um, in a black bag before they go go into class because like I mean I know it's a distraction but things like the things that has been happening in the last past in the last month I think they should be able to have their phone but not you know for them to be on it but just I mean for things like that and also um, I was at I went over to Charlottesville High School and I, I went and I was waiting for my daughter and it, and, and it took forever. Actually, my daughter never came. I waited there for 30 minutes. The lady at the front desk 
I mean, she said she was calling my daughter and I never found my daughter. It made me want to walk through the school and try to see if I could locate my daughter. But I, I didn't find my daughter until um, like um, when school was over. So I think they need to have a better connection and communication with that too. And I want to thank y'all. Thank you for your comments and for calling back. Thanks. Anybody else, Mr. Como? All right, anybody else here in the media center? All right, we will close uh, comments from members of the community and now we will open it up to comments from the board. So I will start down here, I guess with Ms. Dooley. No comments, okay, Dr. Kraft. Um, just just a, a couple of things. Um, one item, um, uh, this has to do with uh, scheduling on the uh, Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, which was yesterday. And, um, you know, it's for, for Jewish people, it's probably the, you know, the, mo the holiest day of the year. So uh, a lot of the students are not in school. And um, Yesterday, when I was at services, uh, several of them came up to me and said, they scheduled the PSAT today and we couldn't take it. And I don't know if that scheduling was done at the high school level or some was nationally or whatever, but I want to make sure that these students do have a chance to take it and that they're not penalized uh, for that scheduling error and um, you know just in general to remind everybody that it's it's really only like one or maybe two days of the year that um, you know the Jewish students are uh, observing these holidays so to just try to be aware and sensitive to that. Um, secondly again I um, regarding the things that we've heard about the uh, lockdowns at CHS um, I am, I don't want to put you on the spot again, but maybe when it's your time for comment, I'd love to hear uh, your perspective on, on what has happened and again, what you think we might do differently. That's all. I noticed a little bit of a trend, um, even starting with our comments from members of the community, Ms. Esposito. Uh, one of the things that she mentioned was innovation. Uh, and then Kim Powell also met, uh, mentioned a new set of solutions. Um, I think we need to continue with our innovation, new set of solutions. And then today we uh, definitely heard from the community, maybe a little bit more in an actual board meeting than recent um, sessions of some areas we can put some new solutions to and think creatively. Um, so thank you all, and uh, I hope we continue to do that great work. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. A few things that stood out tonight. Um, first of all, I want to um, congratulate our student school board member for leading the charge and in getting that survey started. It was interesting that it came up tonight because I was speaking to a former student of mine who is currently a student at PBCC. He's 49 years old. And we talked about our experience together, me as a teacher and he as a student. And bullying was one of the things that he talked about and how it had a profound effect on him, even as an adult during this time here in the city schools. So this, this subject never gets old. You will only continue to perfect it as time goes on. So I applaud you for leading the charge on that. And I would like to um, also congratulate our equity team, Johnson & Johnson, for their continuous outreach to those families and communities that sometimes their voices are, are sometimes not heard. Um, and so I want to congratulate them on their fine work. Also, um, thank you, Kim, for the update on transportation. 
I do see the children walking to and from school. And um, it's encouraging to, to, to see that we are perfecting that plan as we go along. So um, our children will continue to be provided transportation and they're also taking, um, act, they, have an, they are taking advantage of riding the cat bus as well. So thank you all for all of your hard work. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to speak about the, um, you know, the comments toward the end of the meeting um, and to say that it is, um, it's disheartening and sad, it's frustrating um, to hear the, you know, I'm saddened for the people in the building, I'm saddened for the parents dealing with the stress and the anxiety, and um, I see that we have work to do in that area. Um, but for the basic things that we can take care of, the key issue, I feel like we've been talking about this key issue for years. And so it, it, it baffles me that there's still teachers who cannot lock their doors. Like it's just not acceptable at this point. If we do nothing else before the next meeting, these keys need to be addressed um, because we don't, nobody wants anything to happen, but it, it can, and we don't want to look back and say all these, mis all these things that we could have done and easily addressed. And I think keys is a very easy thing to address. Um, and the other, the, the drills, when they happen, how they happen, I will defer to Dr. Gurley and his expertise in that area. Um, but we hear you and we see that we have more work to do. I just wanted to note that I went to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board meeting um, and um, they are looking for student representatives to come and be. Um, it's really hard for me to move closer. Okay, I'll do this, how about that? Um, Parks and Rec um, Advisory Committee is looking for student representatives um, to be on the board or the advisory board. So that's um, one thing that I just want to publicly state so that many of my emails can, or Ned Mickey's emails, because he's the one who writes all of these very long emails. Um, and he wants to make sure that there are students' voices at the table in the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. I also want to note that their CIP is extraordinary and vague. So um, really just looking forward to digging into that at our November CIP meeting. Um, also, um, not I don't have anything wise to say or offer. I just am, uh, our community has really been through a lot over the past month. And Mr. Manning, as one of my um, children's favorite teachers at CHS, um, just have to respect uh, everything he said and just really appreciate when any teacher comes before us and gives us their point of view. I just think it's so important um, and really gives us a glimpse that we don't get even as parents. Um, so thank you for coming and um, saying that and for being the great teacher that you are. Um, and that's all. Thank you, Ms. Bird. All right, I will, I will comment on the lockdown and just the lockdowns in just a second. I did want to just mention, go back to the beginning of the meeting when you shared the board stance on Governor Yunkin's transgender policies. Um, I just wanted to emphasize on behalf of as much of the student body as, <laughs> as I can represent that uh, we're very happy and encouraged to see that you're on our side. Uh, and I think that there could be a little bit more increased a little bit more communication with the students as to what their rights are and um, to what extent they can, well, to what extent they can trust the adults um, in the school system and uh, what they can trust them with. So I think that would just be really important to uh, get started. Um, and then, as regarding the lockdowns, this is a very difficult topic for me, so bear with me here. Um, today, there was an unexpected or just an unscheduled announcement at lunchtime, and there was nearly like an audible gasp in the courtyard. Um, 
and we hear the beep. We go back to those, those fifth periods and that seventh period just in the last few weeks um, where we ended up you know, under our desks in the pitch black. Um, and I think it's, we appreciated the day after the most, after the most recent lockdown. Um, uh, Mr. Pitt uh, reiterated to the students that uh, there were more, more guidance available after. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's an issue not just affecting us the day after. Um, and I think that we need to continue that uh, involvement with the student body and their mental health and the teachers, absolutely, and everybody in the building and my parents at home, uh, everybody in the building and everybody who knows someone in the building. Um, it doesn't just make it worse the next day. Um, it it's continues for for a lifetime. Um, and on a slightly different note related to that, uh, I noticed in my experiences in the last few lockdowns that the teacher, the, the manner in which the lockdown was, uh, the manner in which it happened was inconsistent between the, the ways that the teachers handled it. Handled it. Um, now, one of the teachers that I had during that time is new this year, and um, you know, I just think that was a little concerning to me uh, that it was not 100% entirely clear. If, if someone needs to go around to every classroom in every teacher in every classroom, because every classroom is different, if someone needs to go around and make sure we know what's going on every in every classroom with that teacher, like that's what needs to happen then. Because um, like I, I, was, I was concerned by the fact that, I don't know which, which way was right, but they were different, different ways in which that was handled. Um, and you know, that this is just such a, such a, a grave um, and serious and heavy thing to, that I think is just, I just can't say how important it is that we're consistent, if anything. Um, and so I think just reach out to the students uh, continuing past just the day after and make sure every classroom is addressed, like every, just look at this, this space. There were students in this space, um, at the time and like that was handled differently from the students in a classroom right up there, which is different from the student, the students in science classrooms versus they're, they're all different. And I think, um, I don't know what needs to happen, but something does. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think she, this young lady just said a lot. So much appreciated. Um, kind of what I'm, I'm taking away from what you said is just the importance um, for our students to be able to trust the adults. Now you said that in relation to Governor Youngkin's proposed policies, but that really does apply across the board for everything. And, and without a doubt, we have wonderful staff here at CCS, but it, and we all need to be able to trust each other, right? And to hold each other up. And, and we know, and we've heard, and I do wanna acknowledge um, the spectrum of comments, the, the emotion, um, and I wanna validate the emotion of, of the different parents that we heard from and the teacher and the students. And so we as a board do take very seriously all of that. And it's our, it's our job to kind of wrap our arms around that and work with our superintendent um, and, and everybody else to make sure that we, we do better. And there is some, in my opinion, um, some urgency to this. So I, I do just wanna acknowledge and say thank you for that.
Lisa, can I just say one thing? I'm sorry to be out of turn here, but I am hearing ongoing trauma amongst the student body and the staff at CHS. And I just wanna make sure that it is seen and recognized and dealt with. Um, that's what I'm hearing from the comments. And, um, and it really concerns me. Yeah. And I wanna make sure that we deal with it um, on an ongoing basis. Right. And I do, I thank you for that. And you're absolutely spot on. It's, it's you know, I think we, we did communicate out and those resources and supports continue, they're there. But to just say it for a couple of days and, and then step in line and keep on moving, it's not that easy. And, and I do want to acknowledge that. So I, I do anticipate and hope that we can continue to push out the messaging and, and check in with people more consistently um, and ongoing because you're right. This, you know, this was heavy and scary. I can't, I can't imagine. Um, so thank you again. Tagging on to Dr. Kraft's comment regarding calendars and, and honoring um, religious holidays, not only for the PSAT, but I did hear some concerns about, um, and we might not be able to manage this, but that sporting events were also um, scheduled sometimes on Jewish holidays and, and maybe other holidays, and that may be out of our control as far as VHSL and, and how they do that. But to the extent that our committee who looks at, at calendars and, and if we can, I don't have a conversation with those at the table who are doing that um, scheduling. I, I do wanna, that's the first time I had heard it and seen that chatter. And so I do wanna elevate that and make sure that, that we do take note of that, please. Um, and I think that's it for me. So thank you everybody for all of your comments. And now Dr. Gurley. Well, I just wanna first um, recognize our student representative. Um, I think there's a lot of power in hearing the voice of our students. Um, and so I thank you. Um, I think that there are always implications for our work um, and who better to tell us than our students. And so I've jotted a lot of notes. Um, I've sent Mr. Uh, Manning in a follow-up email. Um, and I think that we just have a lot of work that we can continue to, um, to do. I, I think um, the word Ms. Torres used was validate. And I did wanna validate the, um, the emotions and experiences of everyone. Um, I think there's a lot of power in how people feel. Um, and so um, while we are very fortunate that these things were hopes, uh, but they also were learning opportunities for us. And so I, I do want people to know that uh, with each experience, um, we hope that we are improving each and every time so that we never have to face this um, in reality. Um, and so I, I do want to just, you know, um, affirm you and, and I apologize that um, our children have to experience this because we do, we love our children, we love our staff, we love our families. Um, and so we do, we have to figure out what that check-in looks like um, on a regular, on a more regular basis. Um, I do want to also acknowledge, um, I just am surrounded by some really smart people, um, our um, leadership team, our principals, our teachers, um, they're just our custodial staff, our cafeteria workers. I mean, everyone here is, um, we're, we're all in, we're all in it together. Um, someone said something this evening and it made me just write down, um, together is better. Um, you know, we did that this summer during our leadership team meeting and someone said something and I just, I had to make sure that I, I captured that, that together we are better. Um, and I, I do believe that um, we are building a, um, a better CCS. Um, I am thankful and grateful for our um, family and uh, our family engagement team, um, our family and community, community engagement team. Um, there's a lot of work that happened this summer. There's a lot of work that's happening right now to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our families. We're communicating information. 
Um, I think you heard that with transportation. I think brighter days are upon us with transportation. Um, very thankful for our community, our city partners and getting the salaries up and honoring people uh, because really people, I say it all the time when I'm in buildings, I am so thankful that people show up because people have options. And the sheer fact that people choose CCS um, just speaks to their level of commitment um, to our children and all of our stakeholders. Um, we do have homecoming come up, um, homecoming on tomorrow. And so I'm very excited um, that we just are again providing these, um, just getting back to some normalcy for our students. I see a head, a head nod over there. So our, our students are just experiencing um, just what they consider normal. I, I got to be a part of Spirit Week on um, Tuesday, I think that was. Uh, so it's just a lot of great things happening and um, together it's always better. Thank you, sir. I, I think there's a video, I won't post it, of somebody dancing as well here at the high school. <laughs> He's got some moves. Um, all right, work session wrap up, Ms. Swift. Um, so there were a couple requests tonight um, from our student representative, Ms. Bird, possibly bringing back um, the results from the CHS bullying survey. Um, also, if we could see more elementary representatives on the special education advisory committee. Um, and then lastly, the um, possibly reopening the budget survey for more student responses. Thank you. And then the calendar, the calendar committee to just make note of that, please. Thank you. All right. Um, upcoming meetings, we, it's, it's our, we're getting busier. It's our busier time of the year. So October 12th, we have um, our school board meeting, which will be here at five o'clock. And that's when we meet with Senator Deeds and, and Delegate Hudson, again, to talk over our legislative priorities for this next year. October 20th is a city school board, or is it the school board work session, again, here at five o'clock. Um, and then the 29th is a school board retreat. So school board members, mark your calendars, please. A whole lot of, a lot of meetings. And then we have our next regular uh, school board meeting on November 3rd here at five o'clock. So thank you all again for everything. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting.